Hello and welcome to the Arclight League Week 1. I'm Cass, joined here by Josh Lau, and we're going to be jumping in to the match between Easton Douglas and Michael Jasker. Josh, how are you doing? You excited to jump in? We got Dory versus Victor today. Oh, and any, any time uh, LSS grants us a warrior set, I'm a happy man. Uh, and today we got, you know, the, the OG WTR warrior, Dorinthia Ironsong, going up against uh, the new blood, the new... Guardian Victor High and Mighty. Um, this is this is a matchup that uh, you know Warrior versus Guardian. It, in my opinion, is one of the the, the beautiful matchups in the game uh, because it's very very interactive, very very back and forth. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to this one here. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let's just jump in. I know we've got the uh, the Switchblade Dory her, or the uh, the Switchboard from Dory here. We've got the Decimator Great Axe as an option alongside the Dawn Blade and. Uh, Right here, we're going to have the Axe come in against Victor, the Guardian. I know that the Clashes can give a lot of trouble in this matchup. And so why do you think Great Axe ends up being the pick? I know you're the warrior expert here. I know this can definitely be a hard matchup for Dorinthia. Ooh. Okay, so traditionally, uh, prior to the inclusion of the Decimator Great Axe, um, Dorinthia basically was forced to play Dawnbade, mid-range against guardians and with the inclusion of the decimator great x that allows you to sidestep a lot of the defensive tools that guardian has however uh victor is a deck that um does not run that that many defensive tools because he is very clash focused and obviously d reacts can't win clashes so uh that, that that's a little bit uh I'm kind of wondering if this is a switch list from Easton or is this a dedicated Great X list? We'll we'll kind of be able to tell uh, based on how many uh, attack action cards the Dory has, as well as the attack reaction suite. We'll we'll cut we'll kind of get a we'll keep a close eye on that, um, but that will actually determine you know how this matchup kind of interacts here. But one thing to note, Easton has a thick thick deck. Yes. Yeah, he brought in he brought in a lot of cards for this match. If he wants to play as long a game as possible here, mm -hmm. and uh, well, he's gonna have a little bit of trouble getting pulverized uh, right out the gates. But still, I feel like there's got to be a, a decent amount of D reacts in here. Try and cover that up. And there's a sink below. Mm -hmm. At least getting thirteen out of the fifteen, pretty solid. Mm -hmm. So we we saw an indication there that this is a switch list. There, the D Dorinthia had yellow overpower as well as precision press. So Precision Press basically doesn't do anything for a Great Axe because it says target sword uh, or dagger. Um, so we know that this is a Switch Dorinthia list, which I'll be honest, I, I don't really know if this is the correct call against Victor. Uh, against Bravo, if you have the Great Axe, it's useful. Against Betsy as well. But the Great Axe doesn't really, doesn't quite fit the uh the style that victor it doesn't match up quite well in my opinion here. yeah i mean you were saying like you know there's not a lot of d-reacts in victor and we, we know this right like there's the block cards right uh test of strength this is a way that you can actually get value it's a four block cutting it down to two would be nice but at the end of the day i mean victor can just put two cards in front of this great yeah, axe another and he, doesn't, card, yeah. he doesn't have to actually yeah. block with that four block and yes. realistically mm -hmm. i mean that's the only thing that even gets hit by this and Instead, it really is just Victor piling on a lot of damage and being able to get a lot of the value out of these gold, getting a lot of the clash value. Victor might just be able to run over a, an axe style list, kind of ignore the great axe quite a bit. And we've seen that in the first two turns here, right? A pulverized and then a pummeled golden sun deck kind of just playing itself here for Michael. And he's been able to push just a little bit of damage. Easton's still able to play some solid defense. Yep. And the, I'm, I'm, I'm very worried, actually, for the Dorinthia right now because a Switch-style list generally does not include cards that uh, allow you to race the uh, the Guardian deck. So cards like Felling Swing, Cleave, Sharpen Steel even uh, may not actually be included in this list. In fact, I'm almost certain they are not included in this list. Uh, and that just basically means that Victor has all the time in the world to go through the whole deck play every single clash card and traditionally switch Dorinthia lists are running three attack actions if that so i anticipate victor winning 
almost every clash. So test of strength as well as traps going to be absolute gas for this Victor deck. Yeah, it's why I feel like I've seen Victor doing really well into kind of the Warriors across the board. There's still game for the Warriors to get through. I've seen some Kasai's actually have decent results into Victor, but the fact that he always is getting value out of these trounces, always getting value out of the test of strength, uh, the fact is, you know, in a math-based game, getting an extra card into your hand after blocking yep. is, uh, is actually quite good. That here. It's pretty strong, and we see the trounce once again. Yep. And uh, Steel Blade Shunt is a good card, but uh, it's not uh, not good enough here. And we see another reveal there. Pulverize definitely beating Plow through there. And uh, so Victor... I think he won oh, he both missed the of those. first one. He yeah, block. he missed the first yeah. one, but but yeah. he won the second. He didn't yeah. have the gold to to do to redo the first one, so he unfortunately did not win both. So a little bit of uh, bad variance there. Yeah, he could have uh, but... broken the shield, but I feel like with not having used the block at all, that feels uh, yep. like a like a tough pill to swallow. Actually, trying to throw that out there. Yep. Yeah, the the, the armor suite here for for our guardian player is. Um, basically puts him at effectively like 50 plus health here so it's it's actually going to take at least 12 to 13 turns before uh we we could even potentially see lethal damage here from the the Dorinthia player here um and we see another card there that indicates that this is a switch list the puncture there um i'm i'm <laughs> so with the inclusion of heavy hitters, like the new cards, I actually am not a hundred percent sure if I would even run a switch list in 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 that like a Dawnblade Grade X switch list. I do think there's some merit to running Dawnblade plus the Centauri Saber Hot Streak, um, but I, I don't know if you really need to run uh, the Grade X anymore with with the gas cards like Blade Flurry, Shift the Tide of Battle. Um, and just the metagame slowing down a little bit means you don't even need to include bad, quote unquote, bad cards like Glistening Steel Blade, um, which were a necessary evil in a racing matchup. So I, I feel like this is a little bit of, uh, for those of you who, who, who know, know what, uh, Easton played at Worlds, uh, this is, <laughs> it's actually no surprise that he's bringing the Great X here. He played, he played a uh, Control Dash at Worlds. Um, so this is. Him. Yeah, of course. I know he's he been dabbling blocking. in Dory. He's a fan of blocking. Yes, yeah. He and that, yeah. that's that's actually the you know one of the things that like separates high level players from from you know the average Joes is that they understand what the opponent's deck wants to do and they can block very well. And um, you know, Great Axe Dory obviously requires that. Um, but I'm I'm just a little worried that because this is a switch list that the the, the closing power of the axes may not be there. Um, and things like this quicken token here, uh, normal Dory could take advantage of this quite well, but you know the civic steps here granting a quicken token to Dory, they really can't use that. Um, but speaking of using things, I the the uh, the Victor player here can't really use every card here. Gonna pitch the sick blow for second cycle, which. Um, I don't really know how effect. Normally, that's that's a good thing to do, but uh, yeah. But into the it, axe specifically, it's just axe. like <laughs> actually finally something that the axe can kind of uh contend yep. with. Actually, wants to see that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yep. So I'm I'm just keeping an eye on the the cards here used, and we've you you notice how Easton is already down to 50 cards compared to the Guardians 54, and this is this is something that. Uh, Without felling swing and without cleave, without sharpened steel, it's it, this axe just doesn't have a quick enough timer. Um, all, there are several other cards that could help here, such as uh, edge ahead, or just having you know three for sevens as well would also be able to speed up the clock here. But the guarding deck is just showing how efficient it can be. Yeah. Uh, this kind of reminds me a little bit of Oldham. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even even just like an awkward hand with these two out muscles, and it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can still just cover this up, still get to throw CNC, yeah. Arsenal sink below. Like, it, the, the turns yep. are just so efficient. And mm -hmm. this is like an off turn right now, but because there's not enough pressure from the axe, it, it just doesn't really matter. And Michael doesn't have any problems continuing to put the pressure on. Eventually, he'll win through fatigue. The, this started with Easton having, I think it was like plus six cards 
on the yep. Guardian. And as you pointed out, he's already yep. down a couple of cards now in this matchup with just the amount of pressure that is being put on. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we saw an Iron Song response there. That is actually one of the cards that can speed up the clock. Unfortunately, that was met with a sink below. Yeah. So the, the clock here has actually not sped up at all. Um, so we're, we're, we're seeing the, when, when you have a deck that uh, doesn't, I, I'm actually pretty certain that Easton's list is not running like red overpower as well. Uh, if you include yellow overpower, that's generally a indication that you don't run that many reds. Uh, red overpowers so without basically having to rely on the three iron song responses to push damage is it's just not gonna be fast enough blade flurry loses its power because it does not uh it, it's only plus two if you're not yeah, yeah you're twice. not gonna get the second attack i'm <laughs> sure doesn't affect yeah. it so there, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues here um with the Dorinthia being unable to close the game in a, in a, in a quick manner. And that's, I, I think, oh man, like we, we saw, we've seen East track, we've seen pulverize. We've seen just a ton of cards that can be extremely efficient. Like to cover up an East strike is a two for one to co cover up a pulverize is a four for four for one. Like you, you can't keep trading like this uh, and expect to win a, a, a long battle of attrition here against guardian. <laughs> Yeah, and even with the axe, right? Uh, was it the commanding performance, and Michael's like, "Okay, I'll take yeah. seven because now I'm going the E Strike C and C U. So this is gonna yep. this either take the arsenal or it's gonna just take a ton of cards out of hand. Mm -hmm. Probably rip the whole hand from Easton. Maybe we get to the point where it's still just an axe swing. You take a little bit of damage from the E Strike, and I mean, at that yeah. point, I guess uh, Michael can even just park a pulverize because there's not enough pressure for that. To yeah, feel that's too normally... terrible, right? Normally it's horrible to park one, but yeah, that's. <laughs> That's normally, uh, you, you don't do that unless you're very, very confident you can get it out of there. Or you have, like, uh, I guess if it's face down, it could be Crown of Providence the way. But, right, uh, but there's no crowd. It's yeah. uh, Balance of Justice. But, but it feels yeah. like in this matchup, you can get away with it, the way that this is I mean, this going. Is, this is representing Pummel here. So this yep. is when uh, Easton definitely, Easton looks at the, he's like, okay, one floating, then switches his gl glance over. Okay, Tunic is up. Oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> and it, this is this is a this is a feels bad here, and he says, "Do you have it?" And he's like, "Nope, not this time." Yeah, this and... time around, no pummel, but the pulverize. Yeah. I mean, I guess he's just gonna park it because, like, ah, uh, yeah. yeah, it could it could get stuck there for a while. That's kind of the issue, but uh, I mean, you're also kind of baiting the Dorinthia to CMC it as well, so like. You know, it's it's not the worst in the world here. Plus, having just having an extra card there means every single time uh, you have a resource floated, uh, it could be representing pummel. So, yep. yep. So here, I so so him including staunch response red is a little bit of a stylistic choice. Um, a lot of victors, they're they're they're. Just running two staunch responses, so we're gonna have to keep an eye on that. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm 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 uh, I'm looking at this game right now, and I'm 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 not seeing any of the cards that are necessary for Dorinthia to to speed the game up, and this is kind of a kind of an issue here. Golden Sun here, gonna pitch a staunch. <laughs> for a second yeah. cycle looks like it is not able to use a full value mm -hmm. here though just gonna end up uh floating one resource still representing the same pummel mm -hmm. um but of course there was the opportunity to just pummel that cnc in the last turn so at this yep. point i think easton feels pretty safe that that's not going to be waiting for him uh still though 10 overpower pretty mm -hmm. solid at least this is a warrior so Dorinthia does have better tools to deal with that evasive damage being able to block with the reactions as well yep and uh we haven't seen Oasis yet from, from Easton, so I, I think he doesn't have Oasis in his deck list. Um, so basically the Tunic there is just going to be on shunt duty most of the time here. And I I do like him using the Tunic for Warrior's Valor. That is extremely important. That's something he's doing really well. Is basically saying, you know what? I don't have Sharpen Steel in my deck, but that's fine. I have Tunic, Warrior's Valor, which is kind of <laughs> kind of playing the same role here. At least saying, okay, let me 
one card for two or three cards of you of yours, or the life totals will dip down. So, and it looks like uh, Michael is totally fine taking the damage here. I think he wants to get that pulverize out. Oh yeah, he wants to send it. He saw three blues tunics up. He's like, all right, it's time. We're gonna send yep. another pulverize. Get it out of here. And I mean, Ship he's it. kind of had the space throughout this game to throw these out, right? He threw one out earlier in the game. That's why I think he felt safe arsenaling it. He knew his tunic's up. He just needs to keep three blues. And realistically, with the pressure he's putting on, Easton is yeah. normally just throwing axe at him. This time with the Warriors Valor, seven on the axe. Actually presenting some good offense from Easton's yep. side, but still not enough where it felt like Michael couldn't just go for this pulverize on the follow-up. Mm -hmm. yeah, at least he has a shunt here to cover up most of the damage here, but that was still a three for one. And... Just from a high level perspective, if we kind of look look at this match, like during the first cycle, that's when you have reds in your deck, right? So what, if your opponent is throwing pulverizes at you in first cycle, they're eating through good cards. Yeah. Uh, if you're blocking, which the great axe deck naturally has to block. So, um, you know, Michael playing this very very well, saying, you know what, your your deck is so slow, I can basically. Norman the Guardian is the slow one, but he's like, no, you know what, I can, I can, I could send a big attack every single turn here. I could spinal here, gold sun here, pulverize there, and uh, yeah, I, I see another two red cards there being forced to block, and that's just going to result in an end game state where Easton will have a bunch of blues, and all he could do is send the axe over and. He's going to be, I, if I had to guess, Michael's going to end this game with about 20 cards um, to Easton's zero. <laughs> Easton is not going to die to, uh, to, to like pummel getting him from like 10 or something. Yeah, yeah, of course. He's going to run out of deck here. <laughs> yeah, notably this Rouse not turned on by the two choke slams debilitate. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's still just two sixes, right? Yeah, that's not oh, it's not thirteen so there. No rouse, it's just twelve. But he does have pummel represented and rouse in yeah. arsenal as an option. Yeah, rouse so in arsenal is, is plenty is, good. Yes, rouse in arsenal is like one of the best ways to start a turn, especially if you can pair it with like pulverize. Well, we've already seen him play two of them, so I don't know if he has a third one there. But rouse in arsenal, totally fine here. Um, of course, unfortunately, drew a staunch response here. That's not. Uh, that that Rouse is not coming out this turn, but uh, that's a okay, I think. Yeah, Rouse could have go again because of the thunk and the debilitate, and then there's still the potential of just the e strike. But as you, as you said, right, it, it makes a little bit more sense. Hold on to this. Just go for e strike. Go again and throw something smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If if he wants to get off an arsenal, he can. Or I I, I think we might just see a hammer here. Yeah, for uh, sure. What well, that's actually one thing we actually haven't mentioned is that. Michael is running Miller's Grindstone. So that is very likely to... to hit. It, well, it, it's a must block, right? It's a must it's, block. It's a must block. You just lose a card off the top yeah. of your deck and take damage if you allow this to yep, hit because exactly. you can't actually ever beat Michael. You're not going to get rid of any of the damage from this Miller's Grindstone. It reads, if Michael loses the Clash, right, then he gets a minus one counter on Miller's Grindstone versus if he wins, of course, he mills the top card of his opponent's yep. deck. This is a warrior that's not running any attack action. So at yep. the very worst, he just doesn't win the clash and it's still a four power hammer that he gets to keep swinging. So very similar to warrior's valor swing. We have commanding performance swing. So Easton is definitely recognizing like, Hey, every three turns, I need to be sending my expensive sharpened steel at him, which is correct. He's doing that really well. We've seen him consistently do that. Uh, however, um, okay, looks like he's getting get the block out of this uh, his uh, Aegis here. So maybe gonna be using it soonish. Um, oh, Pummel I mean, once to, again available yeah, for Michael. Yes, and this is this pummel is gonna hit here unless uh, he has a red shunt, which okay, <laughs> looks like he does. Okay, <laughs> perfect twelve on twelve there. Covers it up, but that was what a four for two. So, yep. And finally, again, Rouse is going to show Rouse up. Could, yep. And you know, okay. So what what is he going to show him here? Because if you 
Okay, he's going to hide the CNC, which means he's probably going to try to play that. Sneaky. Sneaky. Uh, very, very but sneaky yeah, you can play here. the CNC and just Arsenal E-Strike, and now you get to yep. keep continuing this pressure, getting go again on these turns. And if there's an overblock here, the CNC, of course, going to be very scary. Or if there's any attack or, or defense reactions available, it's going to be quite powerful. But holds on to the yeah, CNC, I, I, just can throw seven. I, 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 I kind of like this a little bit better because Tunic is not up yet, so it's not really representing anything. Um and this squeezes in a damage most likely unless yeah. okay unless he wants to block here yeah i'd still count that as damage right you you get yep. some armor right you get some of the fridge mm -hmm. yep and uh well east in here gonna be <laughs> kind of kind of lucky that uh michael cannot use this hand very efficiently um i guess he could throw a macho grande that's about it yeah, I mean, this would have been the benefit of but, keeping the E-Strike, of course, is if you draw into a hand, having that go again if you get the full mm -hmm. hand, which you expect to have a full hand going into this mm -hmm. turn. But Macho Grande, I think, is a plenty good use of this. Still get the Dominate, uh, yeah. and that's going to be very hard to cover up. If Easton even can, Red Shunt, and, that can get there. And f yeah, forcing out a Red Shunt on a Guardian attack that's just vanilla damage uh, is definitely a win there. Quickly checking the graveyard. Three sinks, three shunts in the graveyard, and I think Michael smells blood here. Oh, yeah. And Terra these Terra Sunder, Sunders here. Bunch oh, of blues. Boy. Yep. And here, I mean, how, how greedy do you want to be here is kind of the question here. And Michael actually taking a pause here for the first time in a while. <laughs> He has so much armor so, still, right? So he can afford to be kind of almost as greedy mm -hmm. as he wants. Yep. So this clash here going on did not win the clash. Yeah, well. fails the clash <laughs> on the D React. Yeah. He's just gonna set a thunder quick here. Gonna. I I'm wondering if. Uh, because I, I we didn't really see Easton pitch very many reds, um, because naturally the great axe is a is requires a blue, and then whenever he was paying for the uh, one cost pumps, he was using tunic. So I I don't I think we're basically at second cycle here. I think Easton's deck is predominantly blue. Yeah, we we actually did see. So there was that. Uh... Is that a singing steel blade? It was pitched alongside a blade flurry. We actually saw that pitch together to swing axe on one of the turns. So I think we did mm -hmm. hit that pitch stack, and the rest of this deck, mm -hmm. essentially, as you're saying, should just be blue. Yep. And another clash here, gonna result in a victory there, and he's gonna use sick blow here to cover up the rest here. And yep, I mean we're ju we're just seeing. Even the blues in Guardian yeah. <laughs> can be very, very, very valuable. Swing for eight on a blue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that that's one of the greatest blues late game. Like, um, Cranial Crush. It's a super rare for a reason. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, at this point, it's like easy to is defend, a... but it's okay. just going to run out of deck yeah. very, very soon. Yeah, plow, plow through. Plow through is a good card, um, especially against Guardian. Uh, but I, he just hasn't had enough breathing room to be able to, you know, launch plow throughs, commanding performances, etc. And Michael can basically check the graveyard right now and figure out exactly what attack reacts he has left, um, and. Well, there we see the balance of justice jumping into things. No, normally, uh, that doesn't do anything against Dorinthy, except uh, if Supremacy hits you twice, I guess. But <laughs> uh, yeah, so just covering up everything with Sync Below here and armor. And I think we're going to see either the, uh, probably the Macho Grande to end things here, because he knows that uh, Easton has no more D-Rex here. Yep, no um, armor left, no D reacts. Macho Grande easily should be able to grab this. Unless we're missing a shunt, but I think we're all out. Yeah, if he if he has a a uh, yellow or blue shunt, 
maybe he survives here. Uh, depends depends what is what's in his arsenal. Um, this would definitely be a position where you definitely could arsenal a uh, blue shunt if if because uh, it is that time and has to be de-react from arsenal or he's dead here. And it, okay, well, de-react from arsenal. There, <laughs> there we go. I'm gonna survive at one. He's holding on. Not dead yet. Not dead yet. Yep. Um. Yeah, so we're we're at a point now where like a lot of the guardian stuff comes in for breakpoints, and that's just going to be a nightmare to defend here. He's probably going to have to give his tunic in the next two or three turns, which means any of the other blue shuns are going to become very very inefficient. So, yeah, this is this is a look at like the beginning of the end here. Blue puncture being part of uh, Easton's energy base is interesting. Um, there is a lot of. Uh, there, there are a lot of armor users, so you know blue puncture does see some good use and hold the line. Yeah, that's a card that uh, definitely is up on the up and up. You know, with more brutes running around, I think hold the line uh, definitely earns at least a one or two of in in most energy lists or energy bases. It's it's a great tech into into brute, and then also a lot of the yep. Kasai's running around uh, will actually find mm -hmm. opportunities where they draw two cards in a single turn. Uh, you can get value out of it. Uh, this it's definitely something like I I I'm, I'm a brute main myself. I play Levia and uh, mm -hmm. running into hold the line as a tech alongside all these balance of justice is actually it, it can really uh, mess you up as just being part of the as you said the energy base just it comes in as a blue it can block for five which is very insane uh for for a blue to be putting in. Mm -hmm. Yep. And. Uh... Okay, Bolden Blade, Iron Storm response here. If I had to guess, those are two more <laughs> blues in hand here. Uh, <laughs> at least Isid still has one block on his uh, bracers, which is which is good. <clears throat> and I anticipate his Arsenal card moving out and Staunch moving to fill it, unless that is a four cost card in uh, Arsenal. Yeah, I actually missed what which this one was. It's debilitate. All right. So okay, it's debilitate. So all that. Yep. Unfortunately, the tunic's not up, but still going to demand three cards here, uh, or two cards in both the armor here. And yep, East is thinking. Hmm. I don't have my plasma purifier and induction chamber. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? He's like, wait a minute. I blocked all game. Shouldn't I now be able to go on the offense? Yeah. Isn't this how this works? No. Yep. No, Dory no, that is not, not how it works. Thing. <laughs> we don't have access to guns, sir. <clears throat> Just looking through the graveyard here, this looks uh this looks like a list that has gotten quite a few updates from heavy hitters, but it's still split in its attention. So I think we're we're kind of seeing, you know, the uh just seeing the one one of the things is like the decimated great axe against very, very high level players may actually not be the the correct play. Like I, I tell people in general that if you have the great axe, you should run it against Guardian. But that actually does not entirely hold true when you're playing against very 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 high level players because you just give them too much time to to paint a pretty picture so and what what did i say uh like 15 minutes ago he's gonna end the game with about 20 cards yep, I mean, there, <laughs> this is very very similar to the old dip situation i did not watch this mod in, in advance yeah <laughs> i've just I mean, played this match up enough to know if he's got another yep. D react, I would be very surprised, but no, I don't think so. And that, oh, there, there it is. <laughs> All right. Oh man. Michael yep. able to get there with the gold him, right? Victor coming back 20 cards in deck. End of the yep. game. It will take a win over wow. Easton Douglas in the first week. Uh Josh, this is a fun game. Glad we got to yep. cast it together. Uh where yep. can where can the people find you if they want to see more of your uh, your content? Well, on YouTube, you can find myself as well as my teammates uh at the card guys uh also if you want to follow me on twitter i'm josh underscore tcgz uh if you're interested in warrior that's where to find me and where to find all my content i stream every tuesday so been streaming olympia gonna be streaming some dory coming up so that should be good
tweet for all the warrior content you got josh and uh if you just want to see more casts from me you can find me over on twitter at casanova casts or you can just find me at like any flesh and blood event in the next few months because i'm just kind of going to all of them so i'll see you, you all go. around we'll see you guys for the next match here in the arc light league take care Hello and welcome to week one of the Arclight League. I'm Cass, joined by Josh Lau, and we've got another amazing match of Flesh and Blood. It's going to be Chris Ayali on Bolton going up against Rhea Adams on Azalea. Josh, how are you feeling about the Bolton-Azalea matchup here now with heavy hitters? This is a matchup that uh, has been kind of bubbling on the uh, on a little bit underneath the surface because they're not like super S tier heroes, but they've both gotten a little bit of support in the last set. And I think we're going to see more Bolton in the future. And I think people have kind of forgotten that Azalea is basically has a lot of the tools that Lexi had, but it still has like dominate and all those other good things. So uh, this, this should be a good match. i um, excited to see how they, they both play here. I've seen a couple of Chris's uh, Bolton games. Uh, so let's see how it goes. All right, so we're starting off this game. We got Bolton on the play for turn one. Judge during the ex Executioner. This is the new card from Heavy Hitters for Rhea on the other side. Will be used to block on the first turn of this game. Yep, not going to get to see that, unfortunately, but that's okay. Um, okay, so just, just quickly talking about like how this matchup generally... And, uh, there, there's two schools of thought uh, with this matchup. You either play very, very defensively, uh, or you get in the Azalea's face and take advantage of the fact that uh, Azalea doesn't block very well. Uh, basically, all the pumps are two blocks, and all the arrows are attack actions, so they basically are two blocks. Yeah. Um, and based on uh, Chris's loadout, it looks like he has taken the more offensive version. Um, we could tell that by the inclusion of Tunic and Snapdragons. Uh, but unfortunately, he his turn zero, he didn't get to start with any soul. So in order to, you know, generate meaningful offense you do have to start with a couple cards in soul um and obviously you can't have red in the ledger played against you either yeah exactly and ray is setting <laughs> up like a red in the ledger loop here right codex of frailty in hand as well so theoretically ray can look to red in the ledger on this turn potentially try and red in the ledger on the following turn as well uh always a nightmare to deal with i think bolton actually you know takes this the same way that i, I mean i i play brutes i play leviah the way that mm -hmm. you kind of have to take this matchup is you have to try and match the aggression. You have to try and go faster because 
trying to block out an azalea ends up being kind of a losing strategy she can dominate the arrows she ends up going above 12 so yep. frequently and then you get the nasty on hits and so i feel like i could see the same thing for bolton as you said kind of getting in the face of the azalea player and bolton trying to string together you know a bunch of these go again attacks so red in the ledger ends up being the most terrifying thing to deal with and also he needs yep. soul and he wasn't able to get soul on that turn one to get the yeah, uh the train very unfortunate for it. there we we see a very very important card here seek and destroy uh this these type of effects are very, very strong against heroes that need to set up like Bolton. Uh, we see a very, very early Snapdragons break into Lumina here. Chris wasting no time here saying, all right, you like your hand. I would like to gain some life and uh, gain some soul if you like your hand that much. And generally the rule is you block Lumina, but uh, when you don't have armor that actually changes yeah yeah it gets really hard to do so i mean you pointed out right the arrows are essentially two blocks all the pumps are two blocks it's very hard to actually just deal mm -hmm. with this illumina coming through and I, I like this from chris i mean as you talked about right mm -hmm. get in the face of the azalea you have to really put this pressure on you can't let her just set up for free you need to take damage as you can get it and you were talking about the seek and destroy effect right being able to mm -hmm. set up the you know lace with inertia is another one of these that can yep. kind of just take away your arsenal so there's not as much time to just sit back set up and try mm -hmm. and find the perfect turn just take the damage that comes take those you know op little opportunities that you have mm -hmm. yeah in terms of offense this game is probably gonna have six turns of offense and then the game will probably slow down as their life totals get close to zero and there'll be some back and forth uh but i anticipate these first six turns just being both players just throwing four or five card hands at each other uh until they drop below 10. Um, and there's a Lace with Inertia here sitting on top here. Um, one of the one of the key things I think for this matchup is, so Bullseye Bracers with Lexi leaving. Yeah. Uh, Azalea got her Bullseye Bracers back. And this is actually one of the most impactful cards uh, for Azalea because basically she could say, all right, here's an arrow. Oh, you really like your hand. Okay, let me snap it and bullseye bracers and send another arrow. Um, it, it gives her some reactivity, which uh, she desperately needs. And oh, sleep dart here. Yeah, sleep dart for, <laughs> 14, for double digits right, here. You know? <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, generally when you can send anything for double digits, uh, that's that's pretty good, especially with an odd hit effect. So yeah, I mean this one uh, for for Bolton, right? This this reads now my arrows actually block uh, efficiently, and uh, now you can't give your attacks go again, right? That's uh, yep. essentially what's we sleep dart saying yep this is this basically shuts down the turn unless you have uh unless his hand is literally take flight and valiant thrust uh the this uh <laughs> i'm i'm actually extremely surprised he's not blocking no here blocks. Unless he has a, <laughs> oh, right. okay uh well okay sleep of sleep dart gonna be in effect here and also gonna get that uh potter token there uh, i mean can we see take flight valiant thrust right here Ta there's yeah take okay flight. well <laughs> There's take flight. That that's a good start here. The, the the issue here is that you're not able to convert the soul into three damage, which right. is what you normally can do with Raiden. Um, unless so, the only way to effectively use this hand uh, is to pitch for Valiant Thrust here. Which I, I'm gonna be frank. If you're pitching for Valiant Thrust, that's generally a losing proposition. Um, you either want to have go again with like beaming bravado or create your steel hand or something and then tunic valiant thrust or you want to use your tunic for tick flight well let's let's see what he wants to do here looks like it's just going to be okay so a little bit card inefficient here well it's right because he, he charged the banneret and got the quick oh and he token, charged right? the banneret yeah, yeah, yeah so you're right okay so i guess he's just holding on to wherever this last card is who but needs yeah, the they, hero I mean, ability it, it worked out because of the banneret right it, it causes yeah. this all to Okay, well, well okay, bolt right. there we go. Okay, so that that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, bolting blade putting a lot of pressure here, just huge chunks of damage here. And it's been three turns, and I think Rhea is gonna go to 13 here. Yeah, probably. I would say, you know what, Chris, taking 14 to throw your own 14, I'd say that's pretty reasonable. Probably Honestly, worth. That, yep. that works out. That's okay. Yeah, yep, that's not bad. This hand, though, it looks real, real, real good for, for Rhea. Ooh, red, yeah, in the ledger. red in the ledger. Got the Rain Razors and the Seek and Destroy with yeah. it. Lace with Inertia to even of start here. it. Off a of Tunic? Yeah. Yeah. 
this is this is looking pretty pretty good here. The Dead Eye probably going to be used for pitch here. Um, Grain Razors is one of those interesting cards that I'm that you know Lexi used to be able to get six value from. Yes, and Azalea is more like okay, I get like four value if I set it up real well um, with the Bullseye Bracers or uh, Bolton Shot. So we might see the Rain Razors to push the on hit effect here, or we might uh, see that just you know end up in the arsenal or some some either either or would be would be good here really really thinking on this uh opt here yeah it's a blue bolton shot right there's the yeah. pumps to, to set up this go wide turn you're talking about get the value out of the mm -hmm. rain razors by utilizing this and then you get another arrow but it's a blue mm -hmm. and that's the real struggle right it's, it's very inefficient yep. with the damage and instead you see Rhea just decide yep. not gonna go for the azalea immediately they're just gonna load up mm-hmm Yep, just gonna send a red in the ledger here with all the the inertia he can destroy. Maybe even the dead eye here, depending on uh, how aggressive um, Rhea's feeling here. Uh, unfortunately, the, the lace with inertia not gonna do anything here, uh, considering how aggressive Chris has been playing. I don't think he's interested in setting a card in Arsenal huh. uh, for quite a while here. It looks like okay. Going to seek and destroy, right in the ledger, and going to be throwing down the rain razors probably to ensure this hits because this. Uh... So, based on Chris's, uh... I I've watched a couple of other Chris's games. I, I think he does run Illuminate in his list. So, if he has a card like Illuminate, he could block f with three cards plus Iron Song versus is very clean. Um, there's also there's a, there's an extreme temptation here to keep your best card as Chris and just block eleven arsenal it, but we have the lace with inertia here, so <laughs> Rhea really uh, playing next level here. I think uh, Chris is like, am I getting baited here? Yeah, I feel like Chris is losing his hand. I mean, regardless, right? You have to throw a bunch in front of this, but I I I I think he would be very tempted to hold on to that arsenal. You're trying to win this race. It's a little scary to stop here. Maybe this is just soul shield. That would actually be kind of best case, right? You dump your hand, yep. you get some soul generation. Be. Yep. At the moment, Chris's soul level is a little high. Um, obviously, that's not his fault because Rhea let Lumina hit twice. But um, generally, when you see your soul reach three to four, that's when you want to slow the game down a little bit, find a window to use Beacon of Victory, find a window to throw a Celestial Cataclysm out. Um, and, well, Chris here just got, okay, speaking of Celestial Cataclysm. <laughs> I found a window to throw a Celestial Cataclysm yeah, I, out. I, 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 I think he wanted to arsenal that because Celestial Cataclysm paired with like Via the Vanguard yeah. in a, in a, in a uh, bursty chain is definitely better. Um, obviously, if, if you're threatening the Bolton hero ability as well, that's also nice, but uh, here he's just like, all right, we're just gonna have to send seven, go again. And if Chris is a real gamer, he's gonna push Raiden forward for zero. Oh yeah, no, I we I hope that we see that. We need to see that from Chris. I mean, th yep. this is it's disrespect to us as the casters if he doesn't push Raiden forward. Yep, you you always have to do that. You have to push Raiden forward and make them go no blocks. Yeah, and that's what I say. It's a little rough. Uh with this as well right because this just dumped soul and now you were talking about how it maybe had a little too much soul mm -hmm. now he's got zero going into the the next turn which is yes. gonna be a lot more of a struggle especially with snaps mm -hmm. being down already mm -hmm. yep but the the nice thing here is that uh, he does have a very comfortable life lead still has access to four armor if he really wants to he can uh Completely block a lot, anything up to seven crossbone the red in the ledger it's, oh boy it's, that's brutal yeah, that's it's it's a good card to have on top, but there's no pumps here, so that's, that's not true. like red in the ledger for five. Even if it has dominate, I mean that's not going to do too much here. I think this is just a play the rain razors and load the bolton shot and fire it. If I yep. had to guess, load the bolton shot because um, if it hits, you get to just do the reload on the endless arrow. Mm -hmm. You've got the go again. You can just actually continue to put a lot of pressure on. This yeah, is incredibly efficient. Yep. Very, very good here. Um, but 
Bolton can definitely block nine without too much issue here. And if this is a soul shield here, this is really, really good here. Yeah. This having that initial one soul is really, really important. Um, because I like this bullseye. That allows well. you to, yeah, I, I like this bullseye from, from Rhea as well. Very, very, very tough position here. You have to give all the armor here, which is actually, I think, probably worth it, to be honest. Um, Warband, obviously, very nice to bail you out, but without blues is less effective. And then tunic here, you know, if you lose the tunic, you lose the tunic. Like, um, as long as the last card in hand is not Spirit of Arena or Courageous Steel Hand, Chris at least has the option to block here. Yeah, and I'm, I, I really do think getting this Endless Arrow away from Rhea is going to be mm -hmm. extremely beneficial considering the spot, but Chris just going to let that yeah. hit. It's going to come back. There's the arsenal available yeah, for Rhea, and, and five-card hand of, coming through, and that's a Ravenous Rabble to start it off. Yep. And one of the reasons why you don't want is because you, you don't want to have them have an arsenal because they could activate crossbones, and then a lot of shenanigans can start yep. that way. Um Oh, Endless Arrow finding its buddy up on top of the deck here. And going to ship that away. And going to get to look at the top of the deck again with Ravenous here. Because, um, unfortunately, this, this hand uh, does not uh, does not have a pump. So that's a... a I guess Deadeye is a pump. But I think the turn has to start here with, with Rabble here. Yeah, and it looks like Ray uh, did change their mind, put the uh, Endless Arrow on top. So it is just okay. going to be what gets found by the Rabble here. Mm -hmm. So it is going to be four go again. And then we do have, you know, it is kind of an awkward hand, right? No pumps. It's a bunch of arrows. Usually this is the mm -hmm. kind of hand where you'd actually kind of block down a little bit and then throw, you know, maybe just a two card eight, something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But instead, I mean, we'll see. Maybe just this is a dead eye activation. Um, mm -hmm. Try and find some other way uh, like i guess you could even azalea and just try and play a pumped endless arrow but now you're just stuck with more arrows in hand it's not really uh changing mm -hmm. anything and then you're stuck with a bunch of arrows trying to block out a bolton which is not uh, super exciting yep it looks like chris likes his hand quite a bit i don't know why he blocked with the verses there um I mean, armor is so important. I, I don't... And he wasn't in danger of dying. So, yeah, I really don't know what that uh, Iron Song versus block there was for. Yep. <clears throat> paying like, that would be super useful here. <laughs> yeah, paying into the Crow's Nest with the Deadeye. Going to be able to have that discard effect on this dominated Endless Arrow. Yeah, I, also snaps I mean, that, available with this, right? So, Yeah, this... Uh, this is a... Uh, <laughs> I I don't I don't like to uh, mince words like that. That Iron Song versus Block was bad. <laughs> uh, if he if he had four if he had his four armor, this is a this is Block with your armor and a card from hand. And now clearly that man does not have Soul Shield uh, because he's antagonizing over this Block. Yeah, here. no Sync either, right? Yeah, no Sync either. I think a lot of the rated builds are not going to even run Sync. No reinforce here. If he had, it looks like he's just like, all right, I'm just going to take it here. And this was a shift in the tide of battle here. Yeah, it snaps Death Dealer, right? I mean, this is, you just yes, keep the I, pressure on. I, I think you do. Um, And yep, okay, Rhea agrees with you. Snapdragon's here. Oh, I've man. I've gotten I've gotten my ass beat by this deck way too much. Oh uh, man! I, 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 Goodbye via the Vanguard here. Oh no! Getting to getting to reveal the hand and rip the via the Vanguard out from there. Uh, and that that and there's a I pump mean, a single to charge to via yeah a single charge V would have been fine. Yeah, he didn't have to be greedy and uh, try to keep a five card hand here. Um. Yep, read the glide path into Endless Arrow here. Um, I guess there's a possibility that uh, Rhea wants to keep the... Uh, like, anticipating that the Endless Arrow is going to get blocked because currently uh, Chris's turn 
he has two yellow bolt of courages and a prayer Pilata. And uh, I think Rhea knows that this is going to get blocked. So she wants to put the uh, read the glide path into the arsenal. So here I anticipate a uh, versus plus card block here. Um, or warband plus a card block, either one. And I I mean, Chris is basically going to have to play Tunic Warband of Bolana. Oh, Tunic uh, Prayer Bolana, sorry. And Chris Chris seems real, 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 real sad here that yeah. he's having to give another card here. Does he have Does he have V in Arsenal? Oh, I don't know. He, he might have V in Arsenal. Turn, but like... Yeah. If he just held he, on to the Iron Song versus Block, like you said. Yeah. I, and now... Okay, so he's still, he doesn't even have the option of blocking with all his armor now. So it's like card plus pick a piece of armor. Pick your least favorite child here and throw it in. Uh, look, okay, looks like he's saying, or no, I like it. all my children. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, okay. so. And Rio's like, oh, okay, well... I, I guess I'll arsenal this then. Yeah, I guess I should have played the pump. <laughs> yeah, I got yeah, should have. <laughs> and at 12 life here, I don't think the so it, this is very, very important that this hits. Looks like it did hit, but I I'm not sure what it hit. And a card went into soul here. So Bolton has charged this turn. Yep. Here's the bolt so, of courage. So we could go bolt into Raiden into Bolt. So Rhea knows the whole attack pattern here. Uh, the only unknown is the card in Arsenal. Could be best case scenario here for Chris. That's a beacon of victory. So a non-attack action three block. <laughs> Very rare in Azalea, but Very clutch here. here with the dog. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Chris going to have to go Raiden here. Give it go again. Ooh, okay, okay. Lu okay. Okay. All right. Lumina here. Very good here. Yeah, and Rhea stuck on this memorial ground, not having a good blocking yeah. hand outside of the one three block non attack action. But, yep. uh, you know, that's normal for Zale. You're not generally yep. going to have a good blocking hand. But I feel like that's exactly what Chris needed. He really needed that Lumina uh, to be what was sitting yep. in Arsenal. Yeah. It, it's, it's fairly important here that Rhea blocks uh, this first Lumina swing. Uh, with two cards here, letting Bolton heal plus establish another card in soul. Um, at this point, uh, Chris would end the turn probably with uh, two to three soul, depending on whether or not he wants to play the card from hand. And yeah, it, this feels bad here to have to block this with with uh, both endless arrows, but I think that's what you have to do here. If you let this hit, then he can. Raiden, and then Bolt of Courage. You you know the last card in his hand is Bolt of Courage. Unless that was put into Soul uh, with the Prayer Bolana, where we did not see. And, okay. If you don't block the All first right. one, you don't block the second one here. Does Chris give this go again? Yeah, he there does. it is. It's the activation. Okay. Yeah. So is, is it just Bolt, right? I mean, that's... that's... It, I, I think it's Bolt, yeah, but it, it could Bolt. also be the card that he drew. Okay, so, so here... Here you got to block. <laughs> you don't want to give... So giving Bolton a random arsenal is moderately risky because he can play out most of the thing. Most of the things that he draws is decent. <clears throat> because we, we've seen that this Bolton list is not running any blues. <clears throat> Ooh, blue right. Bolton shot. Rearing its ugly head again. Yeah. And... Looks like this is going to be read into. Uh, there's a pump on top. Yeah, there's a pump, but that's uh, not as useful. Unless. Okay, so yeah, it, it actually does work out because endless error causes zero. Yeah, it threatens lethal as well, right? So yeah. that's, the, that's yeah. the main pressure point here mm -hmm. is being at four, having an arrow coming in for 10. It's it's requiring two cards at the very least yep. uh, from Chris or all of the armor and a card. It, it is extremely important to get the Azalea off an arsenal in general because if Azalea doesn't have an arsenal, they essentially have no head equipment, which means 
there's very it's very very unlikely for a dominated arrow to come across um so i would like to see chris block this um just set depending on like currently his tunic's at zero that's kind of the issue um if he could set a take flight there or something a v would be okay um or just a, an attack reaction would be very very nice at this point too um it's very very likely that uh if as the bolton you empty your hand ria can calculate and drop to one and send something very 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 nasty back yeah and so having even in a having an attack wrecked here is actually pretty important late game and you click claim victory here right of course <laughs> yeah that, that is, i think i think we're seeing a bit of a misplay here not just claiming victory immediately yes minor inaccuracy here from ria not just claiming <laughs> it victory makes here. sense for chris to tank quite a bit here though because with these late game scenarios with the azalea you do have to put on an immense amount of pressure to tax the hand right so mm -hmm. at this point chris kind of wants to minimum block this even though you give the arsenal in order to try yeah. and send above four but it's kind of like this catch 22 right where mm -hmm. if you don't yep. block out the endless arrow now Rhea gets this mm -hmm. arsenal and even though you send some damage Rhea maybe blocks with two cards goes to one and then presents you know another 10 presents dominated something right yep. uh presents a very scary attack but if you uh do completely cover this even though ray doesn't get an arsenal it's a four card hand coming in at you and you're only at seven life and you know we see azalea turn a four card hand into 14 plenty of times it happens constantly yeah. with this deck so exactly. very very tough situation for chris I, I i don't envy this spot and i i can understand tanking this block for quite some time yep here you just have to give 10 here and put okay so the fact that he blocked with the bolt of courage is, is a good sign giving okay so choosing balana over the iron song versus here i i would personally uh do the same here because at seven health you're never keeping a, enough cards to support warband of balana here um and he got to Arsenal, his best, theoretically best card, theoretically better or equal to a Bolt of Courage red. Oh, and oh boy. Okay, he's going to start the turn off with just three go again. Yeah, the Rabble draw. At least they reveal the yellow. So it yeah, can just be been covered worse. up by, by a single yep. card. Mm -hmm. And what one of the things that uh, I think Chris is thinking here is that, okay, very similar to rune blades rangers can brick whereas i think chris knows like his whole deck 59 out of 60 cards block uh so he might be playing towards that out where he's saying all right i'm just gonna see if if i could just play towards you bricking out a hand and uh lace into remorseless here Gonna be for eight here. Still gonna demand three cards here. Yeah, because even if you try and throw okay. something back, Ooh, you don't want to take the extra damage from Remorseless three yeah, card re hand. They're yeah, sick. Okay, they're sick. Okay. All right. So two card hand here. If if there's a okay, there, that's perfect. Beaming bravado charging banner out of gallantry here four into three here or sorry four into four so four or five into four or five here is really really good here yeah just demanding um, a card both times right you are you're threatening lethal on both swings yep and we have a pretty good hand here for Rhea, actually yeah so this is, is actually nasty. yeah yeah you're gonna have to really think about how to block here but this this is this this batch is coming down to the wire here. We we saw them in the first three turns throw up throw their five card hands at each other, and now the game has slowed down. Um, and we we have an intricate late game here. Very very interesting here. I wonder if there's any possibility Chris doesn't give this go again. Um, just saving the courage token for next turn. Looks like nope. And dead eye being a non attack three block. <laughs> <laughs> coming in super clutch here yeah the perfect turn for it 
Yep. Gonna go down gonna to, go to one. one here. Woo. But it's and a codex like turn said, with the lace and yeah. having an arsenal. This is gonna be nasty spire sniping. You can kind of pick a yep. little pick, bit off the pick, top as well. Pick your poison here. Yep. Finding a pre med and a code uh, codex of frailty here. Huh. And it's not exactly opt. You can't send these to the bottom. So you're gonna have to pick which one is gonna stay on top here. Looks like it's the pump. The the pump will be on the top, and then the next card will be Codex. And gonna send the pump to the bottom and then switch in the codex. Oh or sorry, switch in the Yeah, I guess it was the pump. Yeah. Yeah, switch in the pump. And then lace here and then codex for a <sighs> zero cost arrow. It's so nasty. Oh boy. Yeah, that's so good. <laughs> and this is gonna take all the cards plus two to cure from Chris. And Chris is just he's smiling on the outside there, but uh <laughs> But it hurts. It hurts. Uh, but it lot. hurts. It, it, it's okay. It's okay. I I'm, I'm not hurt here. So zero cost arrow here. Main choices are bolt and shot, endless arrow, and drill shot. But I guess drill shots for Lexi more than uh, for uh, Azalea. I think Rhea confirmed on the Endless Arrow. It's what it looked like to me. Yeah, I think that yeah. is going to be an Endless Arrow. Okay, so Chris going to have to discard a card. Going to get to set it into Arsenal. So, so personally, I think given his current amount of soul and the fact that he's going to have to give his Tunic here, uh, he should select Beaming Bravado Red as the card of choice. Um, you could pick Bolt to Courage if you think you're going to be able to keep a two-card hand, but I would not bet on that. I think if you want to come back here, I think the best card to choose here is Beaming Bravado. He does uh, have Tunic Red. coming up. I don't know if that changes your decision yeah. at all. Uh, I, th I think the endless arrow is going to come in for ten, so he's going to have to give three cards plus tunic to. Oh uh, yeah, to okay, it. fair. Um, so looking at the graver here, the yeah, it's pretty clear cut that you pick the beaming bravado here. Okay, discarded like the bolting deep. blade. I I don't know what he picked. Uh, unfortunately, Talshar. Yeah, I think I saw a mouse over from Rhea that was V, as though that had been the mm -hmm. card pick. But we'll we'll see. I mean, we'll we'll see yep. on on Chris's turn what that ended up being. I mean, unless you have sick blow in hand, you got to give tunic here. Like, oh, he's thinking about dropping to one and playing a three card hand. He has to get the kill if that's the case, <laughs> because. He would not be surviving. Yep. The The issue is that a single charge V doesn't interact with frailty very, very well. Because mm. you, you can't actually give it go again. That's it. That's that. I think he might have just realized that <laughs> if he has V in the arsenal. And he's going to give Rhea the endless arrow here. Yeah, there's the two ponders as well. So oh, it's. Mo. All right. So there's a choice of arsenal here as well. Um,. This, I, you could just do Endless Arrow in Arsenal, and then you can potentially just send it away for a pump because you've got this Codex and another pump next to it. But this hand doesn't yeah. block that well. The main thing I'm concerned about is that there's a Blood Rock Pox and a Frailty Token on yeah. the side of Chris's. Like, there's no two card combination here for Bolton that's good. Uh, unless it's literally take flight in Arsenal, which it could be because he, he codexed. But yeah, the frailty puts in work though. If that's, that's the case. Okay, so it red red uh, take flight would be coming in for three or four. That's true. So so and at one that could be like if if Rhea doesn't draw a dead eye or knock the death whistle like that that could be it that could require two cards there. And then Raiden would also require two cards there, so no good blocks. Okay, no good blocks in the sand. Very, very, yeah, no, no, no good blocks here. So I presume this is Tunic, Red Take Flight from Arsenal. 
charging the card from hand into Raiden. So three or four into three. It's okay, via the Vanguard, basically, not basically the same thing. Actually, this is not the same thing. <laughs> this can't be given go again unless... Uh, so Rhea has to identify here that she can deny this by blocking with Codex plus read the guide path. There's also still one block on cross draft. Yeah. It just, yeah, that's actually probably better. Yeah, it, yep, it's yep. Block with, yeah, yeah, we're at the point where I yep. think she can just threaten too much. Yep. And if I remember correctly, it's a pump in yep. Arsenal. Yep. If Chris had selected the red take flight, this game would be very different. Um and I, that's one of the things about this league, right? Is that we're we're seeing very talented players playing heroes they're not used to playing. And sometimes you forget, oh, right, the power has to be higher than the base for me to give it go again. And Frailty reduced the yeah. power by one. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's just unfortunate there. Um, that's experience there. Um, this is one of those situations where I don't think Chris will ever make that mistake again. <laughs> so... Uh, Rhea here. This with, is just disgusting. <laughs> yeah, this 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 hand here is pretty good here. Yeah, there's no world Chris Seeking is actually living here. this, right? I mean, this is the buffed up. Nope. Very, you don't even very, need very to reload here. because you you have Codex. This <laughs> yep, is exactly. unfair. <laughs> yep. So two cards plus tunic, and then the Codex will grab a break point, and then that'll probably be game unless. Uh, Chris has sync below in hand right now. And even that, it's not a... Uh, okay, could 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 have sync below Yeah, hand. could be. If he's on it, three, there's, two there's, there. there's already two yep. gone. Mm -hmm. Yep. There's also a small chance he has reinforced the line as a one-of in his deck list. Um, but I, I I don't actually think there's a way out here. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I've been in this situation too many times against Azalea, and it's incredibly mm -hmm. tough to try and find a way back. And yeah, it's just going to be a three card block here. Oh no. We'll just see. There's the lace, and then the codex. And you yep. say goodbye to your last card. Yep. And overkill here. Well played here from Maria. Really, really well done. So Rhea going to pick up the win over Chris Ayala here in the first week of the Arclight League. I mean, still, you know, we got uh, Bolton tr really holding his own uh, all the way until the end against Azalea. It's a, it's a matchup. It's really fun to see that race. I think a lot of the times when I've seen this in the past, Azalea has kind of just blown the warrior out of the water. But I feel like Bolton being able to keep up, is it's really cool to see this hero actually kind of shining quite a bit in this heavy hitters meta. Yeah, Bolton is a hero that was solid and got a few new upgrades. Uh, most of them were geared towards the combo, so we didn't actually get to see them on display during the rating game. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, a little bit cleaner play from uh, from Chris there, and the game would have looked actually radically different. Um, and like I said, that's just part of this league is that we're going to see players that are not not they're basically playing their off off heroes. Um so yeah. Well played to rare. Uh yeah. Yeah, and there should be plenty more amazing flesh and blood action in this arc light league. So if you want to catch more from me or Josh, Josh, where can uh the good people find you? You can find myself as well as my team on YouTube. Just search for the card guys with a Z. Uh you can find us there. You can also find me on Twitter. Uh, Josh underscore TCGZ. I do streams every Tuesday. If you love Warrior, come check it out. All right, sweet. And as for myself, uh, if you like my cast, you can catch me casting all kinds of strategy games. Uh, just find me on Twitter at Casanova Cast. Uh, we'll see you all next time for more of the Arclight League.
Hi everyone, and welcome back to the ArcLight League Week One. My name is Yanji, and I'm joined by Ethan Van Sant. And then I am joined by this little guy, Guri. Everybody, aspiring caster, uh, wonderful cat. But yeah, this is this is awesome. I'm so happy to be here, Yanji. We've got quite a lightning match for you. What is it? Yeah, we have two uh, players who are very well known for. Uh, respective hero slash class combinations, but they're not playing what they're known for. We have Alexander Vore, you know, a prominent wizard player who's playing Dash and Venture Extraordinaire. And we also have Nathan Crawford, like the Briar guy, uh, who's yeah. playing KO, Armed and Dangerous. I wonder if this is what he's going to be known for post Briar, because obviously, you know, she's living legend. I mean, she's they're, gone. they're both green, so. <laughs> they are both green. Uh, and, you know, KO has been touted by Yuki, who recently took down a battle harden with him, uh, as actually like a pretty intricate deck. It's uh, when you play it in this mid-range style, she compared it uh, most closely to Lexi, which I find really interesting. So I wonder what has drawn Nathan to it. And we do have his POV ready for the video today. So I'm, I'm pretty stoked to see it. Yeah. So let's just without further ado, let's jump into the match. All right, so we see that Nathan is rocking KO with the Apex Bonebreaker. Ethan, your spoiler card is kind of shaking up the meta for Brutes as a whole. Yeah, I think they LSS had to juice that card, right? Because they didn't want to just leave us in a Brute meta where gamblers and scabs just kind of determine the outcome of any Brute mirror. So when you take Apex, I mean, the, the fact that it is just five value printed on the board like that, it is so good that you want to opt away from playing your brutes as just scabskins decks, which, I mean, hey, that's music to my ears because I, I really hated playing into you know having to roll scabs to be an above rate deck. Apex helps you a little bit along the ways without having to do anything uh, akin to dice rolling. But we do see Nathan on the play now. Looks like the players are. Uh, I, I think they can actually hear each other when they play these games. They're they're in a call to some degree, and so Nathan, quite a big talker, chatting back and forth, and ultimately going to discard a mighty windup for basically banking two damage and an arsenal into his next turn one thing that i kind of want to talk about before the players like really get into it is both players seem to have submitted way more than 60 cards right <laughs> alexander submitting what 65 in or 64 cards including the induction chamber and nathan submitting 66 cards Oh, that is a great point. You know, it could have been, I don't know if they know the, the deck list of either player going into it, but Nathan could be hedging a little bit that this was a slower dash build and he needs the extra cards to potentially overcome like a slab dash fatigue uh, dash like, type of deck. Uh, and then on the other hand, you've got Alex, who if this is just a more boost oriented deck, granted he didn't start with a tech loop pounder, but you sometimes can just run extra cards and uh, just use them as basically boost fodder, right? Yeah, definitely. And Alex does look like he's going to be skewed more aggressively, submitting the Goliath Gauntlet, so probably going to be trying to use that, you know, on a max velocity turn. Right, and, you know, Alex only knows one language, and that is just kill your opponent as quickly as possible. He is a Kano player, after all, so it, it doesn't surprise me to see him on a more aggressive dash build. Uh, so, you know, not starting Teclo Pounder is kind of interesting because there is this play as dash into brute where you have to expect that perhaps the brutes are ready to just fatigue you out and if that's the case then just starting blindly with pounder uh and burning through your whole deck can just immediately advantage your brute deck so the induction chamber start even if it is a more uh boost uh, version of dash is still something that i've seen a lot of uh, dash players talk about in general as a way to try to milk extra value out of your item before it gets destroyed yeah, and Nathan off to a really strong start. A little bit unfortunate for Alex. It looks like he kept a, if not four blue hand, three blues, and then decided to arsenal his last card, only sending the blue throttle uh, at, at Nathan. Nathan's coming in with a bar Blood Rush Bellow, uh, starting off with a Mandible Claw for seven, uh, off of the back of the two my tokens that he generated on the first turn of the game. Right, so this this blood rush, if Ko can take it three wide, is really the ideal scenario. And even if he can only take it perhaps two wide because he's missing an extra go attack, go again uh, effect here, the two might tokens that have been carried over from turn zero are still giving this turn basically plus six across the board, which is 
just so 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 much damage you see how ko players like really uh you know they can hit these highs of damage not just because of what their cards do on their own turn but carrying over all this value almost in like an ira sense with these might tokens yeah i think the power of carrying over damage from turn to turn uh with cards like cast bones with cards like the wind ups and also ko's hero ability generating might tokens is like kind of the real strength of the deck into the more defensive uh matchups but i i think we're seeing right now a yellow wild ride so i think nathan's wow. build and also yellow pulping in the in the pitch zone so nathan's list looks like it's all gas no breaks wow this is exciting because i think this uh this kind of ko build is not it's not really what we saw popularized by yuki who most recently won a battle hardened uh with ko it was not running the yellow five like draw discard package uh so this is something that you know, early on on Talishar, at least a lot of people are experimenting, but it wasn't the breakout list. So Nathan bringing it back and hopefully putting on a show for us here, because I, I think that discarded the Beast Within as well. So this turn is very likely to be three wide now. Yeah, normally KO has kind of a hard time generating uh, three attacks, but when you're, when you're running the yellow pulpings, the yellow wild rides, you know, that's six additional copies of attacks that help you go three wide on these turns. And... Nathan's also playing Skullcrack, so we know what his plan is. It's to discard cards at random. Right. This list might just be closer to what uh, Nia Tran was running in top eight of that Battle Harden as well. Uh, he was on the yellow draw discards like that, and at least Skullcrack. I don't remember off the top of my head if Yuki was running Skullcrack, uh, but there was a game that was caught on camera that was specifically saved by the skull crack just enabling a, a late game hand of you know, start with blue two cost go again oh it's a skull crack off the top i'm just gonna go ahead and weasel in a claw it's dirty it's dirty and alex only keeping a red zero to 60 as a counter swing should be able to follow this up with either a plasma pistol or perhaps he arsenaled a teclo core Right, and we do see the boost off the top there is a Teclo Pounder, so it is in the list. Uh, this really could be back to the the start of having to hedge into brutes a little bit, but the Teclo Pounder being gone, you know, it's not the uh, it's not the kind of item that will really clump you ever because it is a blue. Uh, but still, in the off case where uh, he really needed to block out next turn, at least that is a non block out of the way, and still a two card six presenting most likely, unless it is the the Teclo Pounder, like you said. Yeah, and I think that Alexander should know that Nathan is not going to fatigue him this game right. after seeing the... Like, Nathan surely is running at least uh, 12 copies of No Blocks, maybe f up to 15 if he's also playing uh, Bear Fangs. Oh, yeah, and he, he most likely is, right? Bear Fangs is a fantastic card for KO, really helping those in-between turns where you perhaps want to you know set up a stronger arsenal you can still just two card effectively nine if you're bringing in the the might token uh and then actually creating one for the next turn as well on an ideal discard so that's basically a two card 10 i don't see why you wouldn't run <laughs> bare fangs yeah blocking with a savage beatdown savage beatdown is a kind of interesting card i think a lot of people are experimenting with that card especially in ko where it's much easier to meet the condition of you know having two sixes that you have to discard during the course of a turn. Right. Yeah, that's another one that perhaps says that this could be a Berserk build as well. We're seeing extra copies of the draw discards, and then, uh, I mean, hey, Savage Beatdown's discarding as well. So this could be a spicier Berserk-style list out of Nathan, which would be really hype, because th this is the kind of build that fell off in people's testing uh, just because the, the ceiling was there, but the consistency was not but look these guys are having fun they're, they're laughing at each other i mean nathan just then off the top i mean it's very likely that you're discarding a six anyway with these suckers but the smashing performance has now cleared induction chamber right off the board yeah and i wonder if nathan has a wind up in his hand or potentially if that card in his hand just didn't block you know it's not always the best to block two cards on a four power attack but hey like if you can't if you can't use all the cards might as well block for an extra point of damage. Right, or it's just a bit of a hedge to make sure he discards a six. Just it could the one point of value lost in the block could just be worth more as making the discard at minimum a 50-50. Uh if this is just like a, a pure mage 
pure race matchup, then induction chamber still converts pretty decently into into damage over a longer game, which uh, with the way that the damage has kind of started, it, it is going to not be an insane start out of the dash, at least. So a longer game does favor induction over Teclo Pounder. So Nathan not utilizing the last card in his hand. Going back to Alex with a up to four cards available to him. Let's see what his counterattack is going to look like. Right. There is interaction coming out of uh, dash decks, right? There is the Pulse Wave Harpoon, which can always be pretty dirty in trying to interrupt these Blood Rush turns. But that's where Nathan, uh, with the Scowling Fleshbag, can really try to set up to disrupt the potential disruption and get ahead of it by one step. So he's going to be looking for these hands that could threaten a Pulse Wave uh, to really try to use Scowling Fleshbag efficiently and either block that or at at least block a max V style of play. So with a twin drive to lead us off here, was that a double boost? I do see three cards in the banished zone now. So I, I think it was. And it, if no, no, so, I, I think, I think single boost. Cause I think he boosted boost. the blue throttle on the first turn, then a red zero to 60. Now he's boosting again with the twin drive. So not, you know, the, the craziest okay. of, of turns. Twin drive is, at its best when paired with, you know, another Mechanologist Majestic, uh, either pairing it with, you know, a card like High Octane, uh, Maximum Velocity, or Pulse Wave Harpoon. Oh, but see, Nathan is going for the, the kind of hedge play. See, I if that was a double boost, then blocking with Scowling there is a bit of a preventative me measure to try to stop a Max V or a Pulse Wave Harpoon, which is otherwise like pretty face up when you do a, a small hand play with a double boost like that, it could have also just been bait out of Alex, right? Just say, hey, give me that armor early. I don't even have the blowout card in this scenario, but I know that you have to be afraid enough of it that you give me armor if you are so inclined. And and Nathan did. I mean, that scowling flesh by gone for the rest of the game. Yeah, for sure. Nathan uh, choosing to block down a little bit. Looks like the Looks like his turn doesn't scale as well. And, you know, usually I think on the turns that you don't have a Blood Rush Bellow active, it makes a little bit more sense to block down a little bit. KO's ability only uh, procs, you know, one time per per turn. Oh, and this is what you're talking about, the, hey, the, the skull crack, not needing to use the tunic, you know, to generate the second resource for the claw. Tunic is actually very powerful in, in Brute, I think, because of how the cost curves usually work out. Right, there's all these two costs when you're playing Brutes that aren't named Leviah, and then Tunic can help those two costs pair next to each other uh, off of just one blue, right? So this is this is pretty big, because now Nathan just, by happenstance, gets to swing that claw uh, without having to break his potential plan around a Tunic cost curve with something in Arsenal that can play towards it pretty well, or just kind of your next draw up of these blues plus two cost go against, which we know his deck has more than normal in the, the Pulping and Wild Ride Yellow. So this pulping does come in for seven dominate. Normally, it's a little bit scary, I think, to swing pulping into an opponent who's been sitting on an arsenal. But I don't think that out against dash, you have to be that fearful of defense reactions. No, no, that'd be pretty crazy. There, there is a block card now that they can run pretty happily in firewall. Although I don't, I don't think dash is actually doing that. But unfortunately, with block cards, you cannot play them from arsenal. So. This is almost always getting go again, uh, unless Alex has cheesed us with a, a one of sync below. You know, hey, some dash decks, you know, they run tome. If you're comfortable running like two non hits, maybe just to blow out a pulping, you sure enough add in one sync below. Who knows the spice? Alex is a spicy boy, for one. But this is even spicier. We are completely off the thought processes of just swinging a mandible claw. Why not just make this a three card 13 with this uh, Clash of Agility Red coming in? Yeah, what do you think about kind of clearing your arsenal when you have the chance? I mean, Nathan could have swung Claws and saved the Clash of Agility, and value-wise, it would have been, I think, equivalent, you know, keeping the card for an extra three. Right, I think <laughs> this one isn't the strongest kind of play anyway. This card is always just two resources for six. There's no other ability you can really tag on to it uh, because it's looking 
it's looking to block and clash rather than do anything on play. So there's potential that it's just not the right kind of arsenal piece to ever combo with something greater than. And Nathan running Savage Beatdown could be looking to use his arsenal for scenarios like that if he's a Berserk list, right? There's other better pieces that he wants to put there. So he's finding an opportunity to, rather than just take kind of a two card six play, which Clash of Agility probably is most of the time, to just go ahead and clear it out there, which... I think it's pretty pretty heads up. If you're building your deck for combo, then you know put a combo piece in Arsenal, not something vanilla like that. So Alexander having a chuckle as he sends back a red zipper hit. You know, all of these red boost attacks that Dash can play are pretty above rate. Dash is kind of like the OG uh, high damage rate uh, hero until they uh, until they came out with a set called Monarch and printed Chain, but. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of a lot of dashes a lot of dashes attacks are you know very very powerful when you string them together because they have the ability to just get and go again in exchange for cards from your deck. Now Alexander is already pretty low. Uh, he's probably not going to be uh, in lethal range on the next turn, but you know has maybe only one more turn after that. Right, and he is he is ready to combat a little bit of that with his armor but his armor pales in comparison to what we're even seeing out of nathan's side because it's not just block there but it's also the apex and the apex can help close that uh that lethal gap right where all of a sudden if you're not planning around uh well 13 damage off of three cards is definitely possible out of a brute deck with tunic up uh, but the pulse wave harpoon is going to interrupt that there there are worlds where sure enough lethal uh can just be presented that much sooner because of an apex adding that extra might token it's something i absolutely love tied to some of the dominate cards like we saw that already with the pulping it's just it's not just plus one it's kind of true damage in a sense out of the the brute deck here which is also spicy compared to how vanilla the, the class used to be and i wonder if since alex played the pulse wave harpoon on the second boost if he's going to try to arsenal that last card try to set up one really big turn you know he does have the life buffer where he can block with armor and keep a full grip if he draws into you know the right sequence i think drawing into a high octane drawing into a maximum velocity could be things that would help him ca kind of catch up to the the lead that nathan has built Oh, oh, absolutely. And, and even off the back of another Pulse Wave, Pulse Wave versus a KO deck doesn't necessarily need to pull Blood Rush to be a blowout. If the KO deck gets their resource card sapped, because they have all these non-blocks in hand, sometimes their, their plays are just very forced. And if they don't have the resource to do it, then you can look at just a lot of hands that are red two blocks that don't or sorry, red non-blocks that just don't pay into each other very well. So with momentum, Alex actually can, yeah, it's either damage or potentially one more turn of big disruption that can absolutely bring him back into this game. Oh, and Nathan is oh. playing cast bones. This card is so strong, hitting six hits, so he also gets the agility token. That's just crazy. What can he say? I mean, this is the best two-card play you can really look at. He's brought six damage into next turn and an agility, and set up arsenal, and has tunic up, and has the flexibility of juicing his damage if he can't use all of his cards by blocking with apex. Holy moly, thirteen is definitely going to be presented on the next turn. Yeah, Alexander really needs to do something to kind of pressure Nathan down. Although Nathan's life total is so high that outside of pulse wave harpoon, it's hard to imagine too many cards. Now, Nathan does have the possibility of bricking. Uh, and so bricking in this instance would kind of be drawing no resource cards. If your hand is all reds, then your really powerful turn can sometimes end up just being, you know, a little bit less than stellar. Oh, ab absolutely. At least tunic up is going to help that look a little bit better. There's still the possibility that it's all red non-blocks and those type of hands really can be the death of you. They are so non-functional and just take away your agency to play the game. Uh, but Nathan, you know, he's he's a player who talks a lot about body language and in terms of tells, and he didn't seem that happy on this draw up. He was happy to play the cast bones. You know, that got a grin out of him. But I'm not seeing him, you know, rubbing his hands together, striking a little bit of a sly smile or something with this draw. So I think he 
he looks a little a little worried. Yeah, he's, he's contemplating. He does have quite a bit of a lead, so he does have the space to, you know, just take all the damage from Alex if possible. Well, Alex did pop the Goliath Gauntlet at the very beginning of the turn, so we know that something is coming. Nathan already burned the Scowling Flesh Bag, so, you know, he doesn't have the kind of catch-all to stop the Max V turn. Absolutely. He's just going to take whatever is sent here, and the beauty of popping Goliath to start the chain is to deny the double block out of something like Scabs and Apex. So there's a world where Alex does demand a card. I mean, it's it still has to kind of be a perfect sequence here, but a max V turn obviously will present that kind of damage. So uh, we'll see how powerful this kind of in-between attack is going to be. Yeah, I think, I mean, the most damage that Alex could really present without breaking the chain I think is in the realm of 22. So Nathan could survive only blocking armor. Uh. But if he chooses to break the chain, then he can go up to like 20, 24, 20, like around 24. If he chooses to use the, you know, the Teclo Foundry heart to generate an additional resource. That makes sense. That makes sense. All right. So Nathan. He's still in the tank, though, on this block. Uh, so if he if he's trying to track kind of the same math you just did, quick maths about what damage is presentable, if he's come to the same conclusion, then perhaps he does just kind of chump block with a scabs here, because if lethal's only going to be truly presented on a, a chain break type play, then you might as well cash that in twice to not have your hand uh, taxed at all blockwise. Yeah, the one downside of dash is that, you know, a lot of other decks... Uh, even even aggressive decks when they're coming in like this they can threaten something like a command and conquer on the back end dash uh kind of needing to play all mechanologist cards there just aren't that many cards in the pool that are super disruptive and so it looks like alex is just setting up for uh you know he's gonna boost expedite has a has a hit trigger but you know oh. not not super relevant no, no. Uh, what what could it bring in? Like a tech low core from hand? I don't even think that's. Yeah, that's but probably that, not good enough yeah, here. You need that as resources. Yeah, it, it, it essentially like nets you an action point. Okay, Nathan committed to giving a card on the block here. I mean, if you if you can't use your entire hand uh, anyway, then you know just map out what it is good for, right? The agility token, probably one more attack, and that's likely off the back of just three cards. So if he's blocking fully defensively, uh, or, or not fully defensively, but as much as he realistically can to still turn this agility plus might into something devastating, he could block down with one more card here, unless he's trying to, I guess, present lethal would be a difference maker in keeping one more card, perhaps. Yeah, I think it's hard to present um, three attacks off of four cards in KO. You know, since most of the since most of the t attacks cost two. I suppose it is possible if he does have, you know, a wild ride or a pulping in his hand, then if he gets left with a with a resource card that can pitch for the, the mandible claws. Oh, yeah. I, I think it, it definitely is possible here to go three wide off of four cards, especially with the tunic up, right? And with the, the buffer of agility, if he leads on a blind wild ride and it misses then that's still uh, you know, going to get the agility token. He'll have to pivot into not attacking with Claw in the interim and just go for like that final attack. But it definitely would be possible to go attack Claw into a final swing. Yeah, so how much damage can, can Nathan really threaten this turn? If he attacks with Claws and two attacks, then, I mean, on average, that should be presenting 21 damage. My God, <laughs> yeah, it, it's going to come down to, um, I guess, the floor of what those attacks could be is probably just five, right? Base base power five. You yeah. wouldn't need to see anything smaller than that. So, uh, in theory, if it is a three wide turn with claws, you're looking at uh, what thirteen plus the might. So nineteen if it's two fives, twenty one if it's two sixes. Yeah, pretty disgusting. Yeah, we'll see what we'll see what Nathan has has cooked up on on this turn. You know, cast bones just so good at presenting not only uh, carrying oh. over the damage. Oh my god! And starting with a swing big, the most efficient attack that's in the brute arsenal. Fourteen right. go again. 
14 go again, and the, the him keeping the cards here almost tells you that he is going for the three wide play. If you figure he pitches another blue or even a yellow here for one of the go again attacks, then that's Tunic Claw right then and there. So I, I think that's potentially what he's showing us. It could just be one more attack into Arsenal. Maybe he calls that good enough, but uh, surely Nathan, I mean, he's a Briar player. He just likes upfront damage as as mean and dirty as he can make it. And boy, oh boy, 14 go again is a just terrifying start. Miles ahead of what a CMH was doing. Yeah, I think the ability of, of Cast Bones as a one card, six damage go again is, I, I don't want to say underrated, but it it's it's understated how much more powerful it is than just like if the Cast Bones just did attack for six on the turn that you played it. Because mm. being able to carry the, uh, the damage over to the next turn means that the damage is going to be applied, right? Like, you can't, you can't really block it out with even, even with defense reactions. It's hard to block 20 damage on a turn. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's all about, uh, especially a brute that can't play into Intimidate and can't play into Recursion pieces. What KO can do then to break turn cycles is carry damage over. And he does that innately with his hero ability anyway, but it's really cast bone specifically that'll do what you say, where if you can have this kind of final two card, uh, two cards in hand of, okay, I will cast bones and I will arsenal a blood rush. My next turn out of an ideal scenario is three wide. Oh, and then also all this cast bones, cast bones damage on top of it. That is effective true damage at that point. It's not just six damage that you've thrown on a turn where all you otherwise it was six anyway. That's not really getting over the block capabilities of most decks. So yeah, card is incredible. And it, it I mean, the way we saw it played there was its absolute ceiling. Nathan didn't have a might token. So when he played cast bones, he is leaving it a bit up to chance as to whether or not uh, it's going to hit the agility at all. You know, the deck builds do run misses, the reckless swings, the the blood rush bellows for one. Uh, so he he really did hit the ceiling of that card. And speaking of ceilings, this is the three wide turn. So, um, yeah, well, <laughs> Alex is Bryson to blocking with, you know, at least one more card because there is nine damage coming still after that 14. Insane. Insane. Yeah, most decks, you know, struggle to put together 14 damage on a turn or, you know, that's the that's the top end of what they can do. Nathan started this turn off saying 14 go again. Just crazy. Yeah, as a starter. As yeah. a starter. Yeah, just, the, the rest is just a cherry on top here. And just, it, it buys a momentum no matter what. The next hand uh, is just going to, you know, there's so much go again in this deck with the draw discards or even discarding the agile windup. Like when Alex passes, it's very likely he just has momentum here for the rest of the game. Alex is definitely going to have to block with at least one more card this turn. And then you have to wonder, like, do you play around Reckless Swing uh, on the future turns? Like, it, even if he chooses to take this to go to three, you're, it's always looming in the back of your head. Like, well, then can I take, like, any more damage after that? Choosing to block his whole hand out, going to six, but Nathan gets a full grip to set up. And, you know, Nathan's deck is set up a lot better to kind of take advantage of these four-card hands than the average KO deck. And we see that him starting off with a Yellow Wild Ride. Coming in for six. Yellow Wild again. Ride. Coming in for six because the might tokens just carried over, carried over. This is now lethal presented uh, right away uh, compared to being able to take this hit and just go to one. Granted, you know, that does play into reckless range, but it's just about making the opponent answer these threats turn after turn. The dash player doesn't really want to block. It's not it's not what their deck is trying to do. So, yeah, it's just going to be a question of does Nathan miss on one of these draw discards? Does he go for a scabs line on a hand that doesn't have go again and rolls a one? There are windows for low variance uh, where Alex could just kind of naturally keep a, a hand. And then on his end, it will be very easy to present eight, you'd think. Yeah, and because Nathan has discarded a card, a, a six power card, his mandible clause does have go again. And so he could potentially even go three wide on this turn as well. Right, right. Yeah, so many of the attacks... Well, actually, almost all the time he can go through wide here because he has Tunic up. Even if that's not the ideal uh, two-cost card, like kind of as uh, you know, one of the one of the cards in hands there. Even if it's one of the three-cost five-attack blue sixes, or or I guess fives that are sixes for KO. If he's got two of those in hand, which is otherwise kind of a, a clunked draw, it is totally playable on this kind of turn with Tunic up here. So yeah, I I would call it pretty likely that he he does go through wide. 
So picturing a yellow send packing to send the mandible claw. Oh, did... Hold up. The claw doesn't show a go again symbol. Is that... Is that maybe a visual bug? That's odd. Yeah. I okay, yeah. A, visual I, bug. I think visual it's a bug. visual bug. Oh, yeah. You were just talking about CNC earlier as not being a chain ender for the dash deck, but boy, oh boy, is it for the KO deck. And that's just kind of the perfect use there of a three wide turn. <laughs> yeah. And, so, and Alex is at one. So, you know, the threat of reckless is always there. Right. There's no way to really bail yourself. Yeah. He, he, has, to, one, he yeah. has to find a way to kind of come back. And, you know, Tecla Court is one of those cards that could potentially claw you back. It is super high value. One card generating four resources. Oh, but we see the pulping oh, coming in. Oh, my gosh. Oh, and really? just no that, no real way around dominate. Yeah, I mean, that's it. It's a waiting game on two fronts, right? It's either going to be some above rate turn off the back of either carrying might tokens over from cast bones, a blood rush, something like that, uh, a dominate from pulping or a reckless swing. I mean, there were so many things that just end the game for Alex. It was going to take a miracle for him to really do much else that game. But but there we go. That is the more aggressive version of KO on full display by our friend Nathan Crawford there. We didn't see Savage Beatdown. We're still not sure if Berserk was in that sucker, but it was impressive nonetheless. And KO is one of these decks that you've got to study up for, you know, what's your game plan into this type of hero? Because he's going to be everywhere come RTN season. Yeah, what a fast and furious start for Nathan. Just starting off with the with the three wide Blood Rush Bellow turn into the Cast Bones and not really ever giving Alex, you know, the, the breathing room to try to mount a counteroffensive, even when Alex could put together a couple of uh a couple of red attacks strung together just seemed like it wasn't enough no and flesh bag is such a huge piece in making these shorter games favor ko the one time that perhaps you are vulnerable to disruption flesh bag can come in and just neuter that turn for your opponent and then ko is presenting so much damage you're trying to shorten that window that they even get another chance to present that disruption to begin with so we saw nathan he went Pretty aggressive with that flesh bag block, but it just didn't matter because there's no other hand that is really ever that threatening again out of uh, Alex there. So, you know, well played by both players. That moves Nathan to 1-0 to round out week one of the Arc Light League. We'll see you in the next one. Welcome, everyone, to week one of the Arc Light League, where I, Ethan Mansant Vansant, am joined by my co-conspirator in all things Leviah recently, believe it or not, Yanji Lee. How you doing? I'm doing good, Ethan. How are you? I don't think we're going to be watching any Leviah gameplay in the next couple of matches, but... 
Well, it's because I wasn't invited to play in this league, but that's okay because I'm here to cast some games and it is going to be uh, quite a bit of dash in this first game. Matt Coles versus Majin Bay We're on two different kinds of dash, which is pretty spicy because, uh, you know, when you when you hear dash already, your mind starts churning through all the different ways you can play this hero. Is it like full aggro with the red backup protocols to just slam max V's, never even worry about pistol? Is it mid range pistol? Is it slab dash? Well, today we actually do have slab dash versus uh, I think it's the mid range dash, not the backup protocol, but we'll find out in a second with some really talented players in front of us today. Majin Bay, a good friend of mine, and Matt Coles, another really strong player. Yeah, so uh, I don't think these players need much introduction. Both of them have been pretty accomplished on the uh, various professional circuits. So without further ado, let's get into the match. Sweet. All right, so like you said, Ethan, uh, both players, I think, are opting into a more pistol-oriented game plan. But, right, right. But we can see right from the equipment pretty straight up that uh, with those Teclo base pieces on Majin's side, that means it's got to be closer to that fatigue style. And when with him drawing up those D-Reacts, I mean, that's just like a, a calling card for that play style, right? Yeah, I agree. And then also you have to see that Matt is choosing to play the Achilles Accelerator, so it's probably just out of a concern for spots in his deck. When you're trying to fit both plans, boost and pistol, you're just short on spots in your deck. Yeah, this is great tech right out the gate with the that all you got. You know, in this metagame, I've seen a lot of people try to jam this into their decks, but at the same time, there's this conversation of where is it actually good? I mean, into Kasai, it's probably getting some card draw. Into Fi is kind of the ideal of when it first cropped up. But actually, in this matchup as well, especially with Matt most likely never even opting to build up plasma pistols, you wouldn't think. Uh, it's always going to draw a card here. So Majin, a little bit of a, of a value play just to get us started. Yeah, definitely. Majin also had a great opening where he got to go first, play a Spark of Genius to get his second induction chamber, and then also has an induction chamber in his arsenal. So as long as he can keep that Spark of Genius in his hand, he can you know play out the next induction chamber. And right, and is that is that actually the ideal order? I, I'm not too keen on the math of dash, but there is, especially when you're uh, given opportunities to search with Spark of Genius, right? There is like an order to how you want the items. Yeah, so I think it really depends on how, uh, like what item setup you're going into the game with. One thing that, you know, you could be thinking about is if you put too many of these pistol items into your deck, especially since if you're playing into Matt Coles, that has the option of playing boost, then you might end up with a hand that has too many items in it. So it's not clear at this point how many total items Majin is choosing to play. And that might be one of the reasons why he went for the three induction chambers instead of going for a purifier. Although I think when he played the Spark of Genius, it showed that he was playing all five. Oh, for real? Okay, I did not catch that. But speaking of Spark of Genius, there is another one in his hand right away. And with no pressure from Matt on that turn, this could be an incredible start to just get digging away uh, at setting up all the, the items quickly, right? Because you can now pretty cleanly pitch double red into that induction chamber arsenal the spark for later um you would a bit of an opportunity cost you're giving up a defensive play in your arsenal which might be how you want to play the matchup so i'm interested to see what he does here yeah oh, so okay. i think i think uh majin is choosing to keep the defensive cards for later on in the game and just wanting to because you you also do kind of want to play out all your reds so that when after you set up all your pistol items you're just drawing to mostly blues that makes sense, right? You're trimming through so that by the time you've only got a few cards left in your deck, it doesn't matter because you're turning those blues into kind of this Exodia combo on board. The resource sinks of all the items just get pretty obnoxious to deal with. Him arseling the Finals Fighting Spirit is something that, uh, you know, initially I don't think I would have expected out, of, expected out of this slow kind of dash, but after seeing Rose actually play her match at the Battle Hardened uh, in Hartford the other week, she was opting, at least with inductions, being the first items on board, to just go pistol, 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 seven was kind of this early pace of play that she was really looking for. And it seems like Majin is perhaps slanted that way a little bit too. Yeah, you, you want to find a nice balance of presenting some amount of pressure so your opponent can't just set up pistol items for free and has to take a little bit of damage. So even though both players are opting into playing, you know, like a more defensive style, it still is going to come down to who can present more damage. And we see that mm -hmm. Matt 
still has max velocities in the in the deck so he is probably going to have that in his back pocket as something that can maybe like surprise Majin uh, if he's just trying to go for like pure setup the whole time. Right, although one less to worry about now because uh, we, we see that because it was boosted away. Yeah. Right, so in terms of this surprise damage, that's something you can always track when you're versus a, a dash that's boosting. Uh, you get to see not only what they've played, uh, you know, dig through their graveyard, kind of uh, assess their threats, but also that banish is something you never want to skip out on digging through because it'll tell you so much about what's left in their deck because they're kind of going through it twice as fast. Yeah, yeah I, now we see Majin with a little bit of a... You know, with the items set up as they are, three induction chambers, those blues can always equate into... Uh, I mean, one blue doesn't even fill up everything on the board at this point. He's got three induction chambers and the Teclo Pistol, so double blue is going to put in a lot of work in making sure he starts slinging damage. Uh, I don't think we're really going to see him opt for the finals. I could be wrong, though. He is lower. He is lower, so if Matt decides to block this, then perhaps going for the finals just as eight value is good enough, but if if Matt does take this, I wonder if he pivots the game plan and just uses this to reload the items. Yeah, one thing that is a little bit counterintuitive for people who haven't played Dash in the past is that when you're opting to play for this like pistol game plan, sometimes not attacking is actually more efficient than attacking. Uh, and the it's a little bit hard to see like the car the total cards that are uh, pitched, but I. I wonder if Majin is going to just choose to deploy, you know, all of the resources into uh, his pistol, which it looks like he's doing. I, an option that is available is he could have just, you know, loaded up all his items and then just thrown the Findel's uh, Fighting Spirit to gain a life, which actually would have ended up being more efficient, but it provides less pressure. Right, right. Yeah, I do think overall we're seeing a bit of a, a visual bug perhaps on the pitch cards because there definitely should be cards in uh, on Matt's side over there. So uh, bear with us on that front. We'll we'll have to speak to exactly what we see in front of us because uh, I'm I, I get very bad at guessing what's going on when it comes to things other than Leviah. But we do see a back to back twin drive turn from Matt, and this one is backed up by the high octane. So when you choose to double boost with the twin drive, that equates to all these extra action points, right? And we even see that tally marker of three on Matt's side. So this is great, right? If you spend one on the Sparker Genius, you're getting the Tutor effect and you get the draw card in a way where you don't have to pop Achilles to even kind of continue on with your turn. The the action economy is just fantastic, but we don't see him pitch, so it's got to be a tech low core, right? Yeah, and it looks like Matt is choosing to opt for a more aggressive play style to, choo to you know, use these cards, high octane, these boost attacks to kind of pressure uh, Majin's life total. And then I believe probably he should have some pistol items in, but that's not primarily what he's going for. I, I think probably doesn't have as many pistol items as Majin does in the initial loadout. And so I think if they both went for that style, probably Majin would win out uh, in the long run. Right. And it is really interesting to see uh, Majin is taking a lot of these, these trades on the chin. Like he is... Happy to eat some damage here rather than what you sometimes see out of the strategy of, uh, you know, these slower decks into a boost dash of just block, 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 block. Majin is saying that he's pretty happy to potentially hold these back and just go for a bit of a race since his item start was so strong. The, the value he's going to get out of actually using a blue is more than just blocking three. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that dash does is once you get a, a bunch of these pistol items on the field, each resource that you spend is worth a lot more damage than the uh, initial like card value of, of three that most people are used to. You know, when you have all these induction chambers out, I believe that each resource is worth 1.5. And so, or sorry, 1.3, so that all of his blues, before he has any plasma purifiers are up, are actually worth four. So better to use them for resources on his turn than to use them for block. Right, right. And we saw Hold the Line was uh, floating in hand there. That is one of the few blues that actually could still outvalue being used as pitch. So uh, there are obviously tons of defensive options on Majin's side, and yet we still see him. I mean, hey, he's going for he's going for the value, resetting that arsenal with an E-Strike as well. So this is just chaining more aggression in arsenal than defense in arsenal, which if I was going into this matchup blind, I just don't think I would play it that way. So it shows what I know. 
Yeah, Majin's definitely going for a more aggressive line. It's kind of interesting, you would think, that with Majin being the dash to submit a bunch of defense reactions, that he would kind of fall back on being the more defensive, but he actually has a life lead. This Findel's Finding mm -hmm. Spirit isn't even gaining him a life. Right, right. Yeah, this could just be a complete pivot in game plan because his item start was so strong. I mean, we saw by turn two, like effectively there were already three items in play. And when you've got that, why waste it, right? And so with kind of the, the fringe benefits of just not having to ever worry about boosting away your D-Rex because that's not how you're going to get your damage. You're going to get your damage from just the items themselves. I, I think we're seeing Majin play this really well so far. Yeah, on the other hand, I think that one thing that might come into play is that Matt was able to play a Teclo Pounder. So for the next three turns, he's going to have a spike in the uh, damage efficiency that he can put out. And Majin's deck isn't as well equipped to, you know, just continue continuously apply pressure as well as Matt's mm -hmm. deck with Matt's deck being almost, uh, almost all, if not all, Mechanologist cards in the setup. His boosts will always hit, whereas Majin can't really be playing uh, the boost attacks. Right, and Majin peeked at the, the boost there. I didn't catch it, but it looks like a second Max V is also gone just from being able to track what Matt has boosted away so far. So sure, he's got these these spiky turns upcoming with the Teclo Pounder, but it's impossible for it to be kind of this ceiling of a, of a high roll normally capable in a dash deck of just back-to-back -back Max V turns. That is just not possible anymore. Oh, crazy, crazy to see. Yeah, one of the things that, you know, gets talked about in... Uh, mo more modern flesh and blood design is the idea of introducing variants, but I think D Ash Inventor Extraordinaire is kind of like the OG variants deck because you don't actually get to play with your whole deck unlike many other uh, heroes because you're you have this random element of cards that you're boosting. Sometimes you do just boost the most powerful cards in your deck away, and and we see two max velocities getting boosted away. Not sure if Matt is playing two or if he's playing the full three, but you know that's a big hit to what his total damage output is going to look like. Right, and to make it worse, if this is the red backup protocol tech, which we haven't really seen that yet, uh, I'm not sure if it even naturally would have come up like as an option on the, the Spark of Genius type turn, just because the reds in Graveyard aren't that strong yet. But if you're boosting away your max fees, they're in your banner zone, not your Graveyard, right? And so if you're just constantly missing this prime target for the type of, uh, you know, just high value play that the backup protocols looking for then ooh, the talk about variants yeah that's just like the complete low end of it but you know there is double induction at least so it could just not be that version of the deck i haven't seen the deck list but i think i'm talking myself out of it yeah and we see matt has already gone to sub 10 life so i wonder if majin thinks that he's able to close choosing not to block uh with any cards on these zero to 60s right right yeah that's a huge point i mean the damage swing is just so clearly in Majin's favor right now. And both of them have been a little reserved on using blocking armor. Matt does have more points in his blocking suite, so that's a little bit of an equalizer. But uh, even so, yeah, the, the way that the damage is shaken out here, especially because there's only one more Teclo Pounder turn to deal with, and Majin's still ahead a little bit, that's... Wow, I was not expecting this. Yeah, and if Matt chooses to attack with his Plasma Pistol to kind of end the turn, I think Majin's going to pull ahead significantly by blocking with the That All You Got. On one of the on one of the pistol shots, this pulse wave right. harpoon not as impactful. Normally, this card is super high impact into decks that you know want their hands to look a specific way. Majin's hand has three blues that he showed, which are all more or less interchangeable on his turn. Right, he doesn't care what the card actually is. The blue strip is all he needs to really make the pistol do work. So, yeah, Matt's turn wraps up here with just one more card left in hand, one more card left in Arsenal, and it looks like a red, maybe a red zipper hit to, to keep going here. Uh, this does seem like the end of turn is most likely that pistol shot that you're talking about to really launch Majin's value plan just light years ahead. Yeah, Majin's choosing to block three. I uh, wonder if he has been doing the math you know, a lot of times uh, when you get to these, if you're just playing for efficiency, it's probably better to not block. But one of the things that you got to track, because Matt does have access to the Teclo Pounder and Majin can't threaten lethal on this turn, is that you're going to have to live through one more turn at least of, uh, of Matt pressuring.
Right. I really like the flexibility of keeping the last blue in hand as the D-React as well, because if there was just some uh, like a punchier closer on that last turn and Majin does need to fall back, well, he wasn't going to present lethal with that one blue, so perhaps putting extra life in Arsenal effectively with the hold the line was still an option he could play for. So a lot of adaptability on his side as the dash player. There's just so many, so many things to do when you're dash. It's not just playing around with items, but you've got a lot of flexibility in this uh, Arsenal play as well, just because of the high ceiling that hold the line could have as five block. Yeah, and the that all you got drawing a blue is like pretty big for Majin. I think the worst card that he could have drawn in this instance would have been, you know, like a red three cost attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's insulated a little bit from any draw there, right? Because if it is, I mean, what if it's like a, a plasma purifier, right? That kind of thing in Arsenal at this point of the game is probably not something he's looking to ever play out. But that is the flexibility of Crown of Providence to just, you know, when you do have a random draw that can brick you in that type of way, you get to random draw it one more time, hopefully into something a little bit better. And we do see that potentially coming up now because that Pleasant Purifier is just in a stage of the game where I just don't think you need it. Yeah, I don't know if you caught it, but Majin had a kind of look of like, ooh, I, I don't know if I wanted to draw that uh, when he saw that he had the Plasma Purifier in his hand. But I think that he'll be okay because he has the Crown of Providence, like you said. You know, the ability to just kind of shuffle it away. And he's probably just going to do that at the beginning of the of the turn. I think this is a pretty heads-up move to, to just block away the Crown of Providence at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Nodding. Right, because it's just going to inform the rest of your blocks that much better, right? And we do see him rewarded. He has now swapped it for a very flexible card in hand. A blue block three, or rather, a block three or a blue, right? Yeah, and I believe Majin, if possible, would want to try to keep one of these red two costs as a kind of unexpected spike in damage at the end of the turn. Uh, although he did show both of them to the Pulse Wave <laughs> Harpoon, so maybe not so unexpected at this point. Right, yeah, if he can do anything to present lethal in this next hand, I think he absolutely should go for it. And we, we see that very, very likely in, in how this is lining up, because Majin's sitting at 8... Yes, there are four action points. If that last card in hand for Matt is a blue, then in theory with the Teclo core, uh, he could he could actually do it, right? Turn that one blue into four resources, shoot four more times. That would demand, what, a card and at least an armor block? But Majin could then keep the last two cards. Yeah, I if believe, I believe Matt has, has pitch. It's a little confusing, but oh, Matt, oh, Matt, that's Matt, right. Matt has pitch still. You're right. Well, then there might be two cards demanded here. We we shall see. There's always that scenario of uh, using Achilles Accelerator in a late stage like this just because you know it takes a card. Uh, and that oof, that is one of the, the dirtier plays that Dash players can line up is just take an extra card out of nowhere because they have this on-demand ability to get an extra resource off of Teclo and an extra action point off of the Achilles. Yeah, and I think having the having the high... Show, this, is, this turn is really showcasing the power of high octane, just accumulating all of these action points um so even though majin has you know an extra pistol item the pistol items are actually not as efficient uh in a shorter game as the high octanes are right yeah, well we've seen i've been very impressed on the the back-to-back -back high octanes actually converting uh to pretty clean use of all the action points the first time it didn't convert to damage super well it was with the spark of genius but you know that that play saves you using Achilles, so it's so much more threatening in the late game. And we see Majin in the tank on these pistol shots. What do you think he's he's thinking about? Is it just giving cards? Yeah, I, he's probably calculating uh, how many how many cards that he can he can hold on to. But it looks like Matt should be able to shoot at least three more times with four resources because he does have access to uh, the the Achilles accelerator. Right, right. Yeah, so now everything's pivoted. Keeping those two cards is... What is it? Is it still... It's it's not possible anymore, right? Because Matt can shoot two more times after this. One more time with the natural action point, and then one more time off the Achilles. So Majin can keep a blue, but yeah, no longer... Yeah, he can, he can keep one card, and he's going to present four back, but four should not demand a card out of Matt. So I believe Majin is starting to see the writing on the wall. He needs... Uh, one of the ways that he, he could kind of escape from this situation is if Matt gets an unlucky draw and draws, you know, something like four reds. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that would be pretty huge uh, in terms of what damage you can present back, right? You, you mentioned four. Matt, also, we we talked about the armor like two turns ago. It's still sitting there for Matt. So in these kind of late game situations, there's almost like no harm, no foul for Matt to throw in the uh, Teclo Pounder just because he wants to drag out that block over the course of two turns. So Majin isn't even likely to, to truly land that four. Yeah, a, a play that Matt also has available to him should you choose to is that you can actually use that adaptive plating to block uh, three, uh, sacrificing induction chamber. You know, Ooh. Majin's already at the life uh, total where potentially just like saving an extra card in hand is much more meaningful than having an induction chamber on the board. Oh, I can't quite tell with the lack of pop-ups here, but I I think Matt is contemplating now, right? We're at that stage where Atalashar is attempting to pass, but Matt has the choice. Do you activate Achilles or not. And if he decides to not activate it, Majin has opted to not keep... Okay, looks like he didn't activate Achilles. Majin did not keep the two cost to guaranteed present lethal with that hand. Yeah, we didn't see the card that, that Matt pitched to activate the Tekla Foundry Heart. It's possible that he just didn't have the resources. That's fair. That's true. That's true. Uh, and so this is actually pretty huge for Majin. Just being able to keep that extra blue means that instead of attacking... Uh, twice with the plasma pistol, he should be able to attack uh, all uh, four times with it. Yep, with the tunic resource as well, there is no doubt he gets to pew pew away. Uh, with that, with the combat chain breaking, it's actually pretty critical as well to even milk more block out of the armor right here, right now. Because the you know one thing you can do pretty cleanly into the pistols is just go to one. And oh, so yeah. having more choices to do that with the armor is pretty key. Like at this point, you can take another two damage, but then because the chain was broken, you can block one with adaptive, one with teclo, uh, and then there you go. Just sit pretty at one without actually having to give a card. Or, I mean, you can do it this way too. It's all the same, because now the other one will block one, and the yeah, same deal. Yeah, and I think he's just choosing to use the Tunic resource, expecting to have to block with it this turn. Uh, one of the nice things uh, about playing Dash is that you can you know, carry over these resources to future turns. doesn't even have to be to the next turn, just like whenever it's going to be relevant that you use the Steam Counter on the item. Right. This What a tight endgame we've kind of launched ourselves into. Both players were trading so aggressively, but now we see we are in not only the must-block stage, but the literal one... Well, not quite one-to-one. -one. It looks like he is going to sacrifice the induction chamber, like you mentioned. I wonder, is is that always correct? I feel like going to one is almost no difference when you're faced with just a barrage of pistol shots, which are always two. Yeah, I think the main difference is if Matt doesn't think that he can pressure out uh, you know, the all the cards from Majin's hand, and he knows that Majin does have access to seven power attacks. So True. if you if you go like a seven power attack, then instead of uh, ripping three cards from uh, Matt's hand would only take two. That is a huge point. And and actually, yeah, the way that we saw that hand drawn up, the option was there for an E-Strike type of play. We see Majin pretty quickly throw that on the blocks. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's just, that's very heads up. That's very heads up. I wonder if perhaps this turn, because of Teclo resources or something, there actually was a way to use double induction. It's tight. We're also in that range of... Achilles just kind of cheating you the one extra use of induction anyway. So, ooh, I'm ex this is tough. This is tough. Matt is, I mean, we're going to see, can you take all of Majin's cards or not? Because if you can't, then Majin is really going to strip you down with that next blue. Yeah, Matt really has the the pressure on to try to pressure, to try to take all of Majin's cards. And it looks like he'll, he will be able to, uh, with this zipper hit, uh, taking the tunic and the fate for scene. And then the last uh, pistol shot should take the last, the final card. That's right. Oh wow, what a what a powerful op there. That is huge. That is huge for Majin to be able to send that to the bottom. That should be. I mean, it's not the only non-block in the deck. There's definitely those items, but we've seen at this point a plasma purifier go to the bottom. Now he just opted a heart to the bottom. There oh. should be at least two more. Yeah, but I think I think uh, Matt has two resources, so I think he's oh, going to he? use the Achilles accelerator to end the game. Oh wow. And just like that, Matt clinches it. What a crazy game. We were getting so excited for the, the aggressiveness possible by Majin's dash deck. But, you know, maybe 
maybe if you played a little bit differently with more defense uh, cards in Arsenal, you get a couple extra turns out of this because Matt was, I mean, at this point, right, you, if you survive the kind of Achilles type turn, the damage is just so much more face up. Very, very interesting game to watch. Well played. Yeah, well played to both players. Uh, I think that game ultimately came down to kind of uh, Matt seeing his power cards and so even though he got a little bit unlucky boosting away, you know, two of his max velocities, I think being able to see uh, the high octanes coupled with the twin drives, you know, twin drive plus high octane is such a powerful combination, allowing you to boost twice, get two action points instead of one extra action point, uh, and, and match kind of being able to convert all of the action points into uh, something offensive. Right, and I thought dash IO was the dash we had to worry about with action points galore, but when you combo twin drive and high octane, yeah, we saw some dirty things happen that game. So congrats to Matt Coles pulling ahead 1-0 for week one of the Arc Light League. But, you know, both players are just so high quality when it comes to putting on a show for Flesh and Blood. I am pretty stoked to see what they have in store for week two. So with that, Yanji, it was a pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for watching the Arc Light League week one.